my goodness, what a week for you as a, a researcher and a, a subject matter expert. You're all over the place talking with all sorts of media outlets about the work that you do. So thank you for taking some um, time to visit with me today. My pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for hosting. So I want to, um, this is a very somber week, and I think as we get closer to the weekend, it's more and more on people's minds. Uh, the um, 20th sort of remembrance of the September 11th attacks, um, which were extremism-based. And you work for the Center for Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism Studies. Um, where were you on September 11th, 2001? So actually, I was both in Washington, D.C. and New York City on 9-11, I had a, uh, I was a, a graduate school student. I was uh, studying uh, at Columbia University and I was working part time on the side and would go periodically to Washington DC uh, just to make some, some ends meet. So I was actually on a train. I probably left, gosh, um, Penn Station in New York City, you know, shortly after 7 a.m. before, you know, all of the, the chaos ensued. Um, and it was probably around the, gosh, just maybe in Philadelphia, Delaware, where I got a call from a, a colleague of mine who I worked with in a congressional office. Um, and I always have this, uh, you know, this so etched in my memory. Her name is Charlotte. Charlotte called and, you know, when I was in government the first time, actually, um, I had worked on national security issues and actually knew a little bit about bin Laden. And she told me what happened, you know, shortly after 8.30 in the morning um, in New York, where I lived. Um, and as soon as she said something along the lines of a plane crashed into the Twin Towers, um, I immediately thought it was bin Laden and told her, I thought this sounds like something Al Qaeda would do. And then the second plane hit um, no more than, gosh, 20 minutes after that. And eventually I made my way. Um, the train continued on the Amtrak into Union Station. And when I got to Union Station, um, American Airlines 77 had just recently hit the uh, hit the Pentagon, maybe like 20 minutes before our train got in. And there was people just running around because there was a concern about the, the fourth aircraft that eventually was taken down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, potentially coming to hit the, the Capitol building. And those of you who know Washington, D.C. geography, uh, Union Station is very close to to the Capitol. And so it was madness. It was chaos. I had never seen anything like that in, in Washington. And it really, really, you know, I watched the coverage with friends um, throughout the, the day. Um, but it really started, like, hitting me when I went back into New York, back on Amtrak. And you just saw the, the smoldering of the Twin Towers. And, and for me also, it was not just the, the smoldering, but it was the smell that was pervasive throughout the city of New York for really months. Um, and to me, it was really a, a formative experience um, being in both those cities, um, watching New York be attacked, Washington be attacked, the United States be attacked, and really motivate me to actually go back into government and to try to pursue a career in counterterrorism. Is there any difficulty conveying the visceral feelings that came on that day that we lived with for months and years afterwards with people who have grown up since then, with some of the students that you work with? Do they understand really the, what it was like to be alive on that day? It's really hard to convey that. And the best way, I think, to convey it is through um, watching um, things. And right now, there are a couple of good documentaries out on 9-11 that I've watched. Um, for instance, Turning Point um, by Netflix is a five-episode uh, um, documentary. And it really took me back. And I think if younger people who don't necessarily remember 9-11 watch a documentary like that, they'll have a, a good feeling as to why people like me um, have those visceral feelings um, that we experience when thinking about this day that's just two days away, the 20th anniversary of September 11th. And in, in my lectures, when I first meet my students, I do talk about the experience I just shared with you, Andrew, about where I was on 9-11. And it's always, it's always difficult for me to talk about it because it was, it's still, you know, right in my memory, um, like right in the, the beginning of my memory bank. It is something um, I will, I will never forget. And, and, and to me, it's, it's about sharing that story. Um, but then throughout the classes I teach, it's, it's about talking about the motivations of these bad actors who did it, the mistakes that the U.S. government made that uh, led to those events, because there was some significant failings by the U.S. government, 
um, and to try to explore as best we can, because I teach a course on the Islamic State, um, these motivations that go into these horrible events, how these events are financed, and, and try to, um, as best I can, speak about these things um, as objectively as I possibly can, even though I had this very visceral experience. Terrorism is one of the things that you research, you study, you teach, you have, it's part of who defines you, your identity as a scholar. This started the war on terror. Was that a fair name to give the past two decades of military action by the United States and their allies throughout it, the world? Yeah, I think it is a fair name. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that it's the right way that it was um, pursued in retrospect. Um, it, there is no question that it was a, a war on terrorism. The United States used its military um, in ways to uproot a transnational actor. And we certainly can dissect the mistakes made. And there were many mistakes made during that period of time in which this you know, so-called war on terrorism occurred. But um, absolutely, it was a war on terrorism. That's what uh, President Bush, president at the time, called it. We used the military might of the United States in a fashion um, that was very warlike. Um, and in the wake of the way we used those tools, um, there was a fortunate number of really problematic things that occurred in the aftermath, in which, for instance, human rights were, were trampled upon. Um, situations in which the United States decided to work with actors in Afghanistan who were not always on the up and up, who carried out um, very problematic human rights abuses themselves. And those are some of the mistakes that the United States is going to have to live with for the years ahead that stem for this war on terrorism. The, the, the actions of September 11th and other domestic terrorist attacks, I'm thinking of Oklahoma City bombing and the January 6th, these come out of extreme groups, extremism. Does extremism always lead to terrorism or is there, is there no. a tipping point? No, it doesn't always lead to uh, terrorism. You know, one can be an extreme in, in their views and never act on their extreme views in a violent, terroristic way in which um, that person is carrying out a politically motivated act of violence against non-combatants in an effort to create an atmosphere of fear. Um, it, it's usually further along that pathway where an individual may make that jump from simply uh, you know, drinking from the fountain of radical ideology to taking a more concrete, violent act. So, um, you know, there is this line that exists in this uh, continuum in which an individual may be in that pathway. And there will be times in which a person walks away from extremist rhetoric and ideology and never carry out an act of, of violence. And in fact, um, you know, in, in the best cases, they start speaking out against that extremist ideology that they were once part of, and they become one of those authentic voices that actually can be really powerful in trying to walk away people from that extremist ideology that may be taking them towards a pathway of violence. So uh, it, it, there are some fantastic, really, um, people out there who have like, pushed back against narratives that they once actually were believing in. The Washington Post opinion piece, um, which came out this week, um, we've talked in uh, sort of preparing uh, for today about the purpose of that, who the audience of that is. If someone reads that, what's the next step that they should do if they feel like something needs to be done? Is it email your representative at the state level, a local level, the federal level? What's the, what's the next step of a person who may read um, your most recently published work? So whenever somebody like me publishes an op-ed in a place like the Washington Post, it's an effort to try to influence the conversations that are ongoing regarding threats that the United States is facing. And there's a very significant domestic threat the United States obviously faces and has faced for quite some time now. And in my mind has been ignored for, for far too long. So if that specific piece that I wrote for the Washington Post that articulated five specific things that can be done to try to counter the extremist threat, I do believe the most powerful way people can try to create change is by engaging directly with policymakers and leadership figures who have influence. And that can mean at the state, local, or at the federal level. Now, when it comes to trying to implement some of the things I specifically mentioned, for instance, the need for the US government to consider using its sanction tools against transnational actors who are based overseas, who are part of bad groups, um, 
that is obviously an executive branch function, but the legislative branch has a lot of influence over the executive branch about the policies the executive branch should pursue. So influencing um, your senator or your representative to put pressure on the executive branch could be one effective way to create a, a change in policy. It, it's not just engaging with government, though. It also is engaging with um, Silicon Valley very directly. We all have our social media. We're on social media right now. And social media has been used by bad actors to finance themselves. It has been used by bad actors to propagate um, virulent ideology. It has been used by bad actors to spread myths and disinformation and conspiracy theories. So we can all interact directly with Silicon Valley in some way. Um, it's those of us like me who live in you know the back door of Silicon Valley, know people in Silicon Valley, we we can try to put pressure on them. And a really good example of that is there was a really distasteful um, website um, called um, 8chan. Um, and it was receiving services from a company in San Francisco providing essentially security services for 8chan because 8chan is this toxic image board in which you have a lot of far right actors um, spread the manifestos of, of really bad actors or they you know, have the shootings that they're carrying out actually live on 8chan. And there was this company called um, Cloudflare that was providing the security services because you know, there are people who are trying to take down 8chan all the time, and they need the security services um, of a company like Cloudflare to protect their, their, their domain. And people spoke up in the wake of a number of horrific shootings, like the Bretton Terrett shooting in New Zealand that killed more than 50 innocent Muslims while they were worshiping in their mosques. Uh, Pressure was put on that company, Cloudflare, and they disassociated themselves from 8chan. And 8chan had to go dark for a number of months. Unfortunately, they became um, an entity again called 8kun, and they have their services protected in, in Japan. But for a few month period of time, people spoke out. People like you and me um, said that, that that website, that's so wrong what you're hosting here. Um, and you're providing services to them. And the company made a decision that it hurt their reputation and there was too much risk by continuing that business relationship they had with that company. So people can take action, um, they can speak out and members of Congress heard that and they convened meetings and hearings and they put essentially the people who um, created these um, websites and who were providing services for these really dark places on the internet, um, a, a place in which they had to testify. And, and it, they did not look good. Um, so this is like bringing people like Jim Watkins, um, Ron Watkins, who are you know part of 8chan and then eventually 8kun, and the Silicon Valley company provider who was providing those services um, to them. And, and people walked away. Um, so I think there's a story here that, you know, speaking up, interacting with people, any number of ways can actually create change. There's often a feeling that I don't have power as an individual, but it sounds like what you've just described is you do have power as an individual. You do have a voice that people will listen to, and you can use it to affect the change that you want to see in the Internet where we live so much of our lives. Absolutely. We, we all can tomorrow delete our Facebook accounts. We can delete our, our Twitter accounts. Um, we, we have that, that power to influence things. And if people start shutting off from social media because they don't like things that are you know, being propagated over social media um, and people leave and walk away from those accounts, those companies will make change uh, because it affects their business bottom line. So we all have an ability to affect change because these businesses, they, they want us on their platforms. Um, they need us on those platforms. And if they want us to stay on those platforms, they should be responsive to us. And if we're not liking what we see, we should leave. That's part of the counterterrorism part of what you study um, and research and talk about how to combat these things. Let's talk a little bit about the extremism and the domestic terrorism, which is another thing you bring up in the Washington Post uh, op-ed piece. And one of the, the most sort of clear example of that happened just this year in 2021 on January 6th in the nation's capital when people were brought together and they stormed the halls of the capital. What was that like for you to watch? When did you first hear it and what were you thinking about? 
So I was watching it in real time and literally tweeting, I think, in, in real time as I was watching it. And I actually worked on Capitol Hill for about four years from 1997 till the spring of 2001. And then I made my way to, to New York City in the fall of 2001. And, and watching the Capitol where I used to work um, in the office buildings essentially become vandalized and a, a battle space for um, individuals uh, like Oath Keepers, who are an anti-government group, the Three Percenters, who are an anti-government group, the Proud Boys, who are like a quasi-white supremacist group, even though they try to present themselves as not being white supremacists, and then QAnon conspiracist theorists storming the Capitol because they didn't like democracy unfolding in the way that it was unfolding, and trying to stop democracy from actually carrying out, um, and Vice President Pence carrying out his constitutional duties. And for me, um, it was really resonant because I had worked in those buildings. Um, but it was also r resonating with me because at CTEC, the Center on Terrorism, Extremism, Counterterrorism, where I'm the director here at the Middlebury Institute, we study in depth these groups, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, um, QAnon. We produced reports on all of these groups more than a year before the storming of the Capitol. Um, my deputy director is a, a guy by the name of Alex Newhouse. Um, he co-wrote a couple of these pieces I'm talking about on these groups with some of our graduate research assistants, and they dig deep into these extremist milieus. Um, and all the, the, the red warning signs were there before the 6th of January. There was so much chatter online over mainstream social media platforms, but also particularly over um, you know, less uh, mainstream platforms like Parler. There, there were people talking big games in advance of, of January 6th, that it was simply gonna be more than listening to the political speeches of people like President Trump. It was, it was good for them, it was gonna be something else besides that. And it became um, a, a riot, um, it became an insurrection, and it was a direct threat to, to democracy. Um, and I think about also those uh, Capitol Police officers who were trying to uh, stop the, uh, the masses um, from storming the, the gates of the Capitol. And they put themselves in harm's way to protect uh, lawmakers. And thankfully, um, no lawmakers were, were harmed. Um, and uh, that said, even though there were no lawmakers harmed, on the 6th of January, um, we need to really reflect on how bad it could have been because it could have gotten much worse than it was. And I think in some ways, this is gonna sound strange, Andrew, I think we got lucky that it wasn't um, far worse than it was in terms of casualties. That's what I was going to ask you about next. And I think part of the, the opinion piece this week in the Post is another one of those trying to raise awareness that this danger is still out there and people need to pay attention. Just don't let it get caught in the teeth of the news cycle. Were you on the edge of your seat watch, waiting for it to get to that next level for a, an explosion to go off, someone to, to ignite a, you know, an explosive device inside that building? Or did it go further than you even thought it would? I actually, I, I thought it could result in, in more casualties, more um, small arms shootings, um, because groups like the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters, they're armed to the teeth, generally speaking. Um, and I was also worried about just the, the overall ransacking of the Capitol building, but I was really worried about somebody starting a fire. That, that would have been really easy to have done. Um, and that would have created a, a, a really uh, momentous symbol for those within the radical right. Uh, so in that sense, I was quite worried about the, the capital and the people within it in, in terms of suffering at, at the, the hands of an extremist who may have been willing to, to pull a trigger or to, to light a match. That was what I was the most concerned about. In some ways, actually kind of surprised it didn't happen. Are you hoping that people who are on the January 6th commission right now, the special commission in Congress, see your op-ed and read that and help influence the work that they're doing as they go on with that? I hope so. I, I hope they uh, at least consider having debates on some of the recommendations I put forward. And I know and I recognize fully that not everybody's going to agree with these recommendations. Um, both Democrats and Republicans may actually take issue with some of these recommendations I put forward. For instance, the, the, the issue of putting forward a domestic terrorism law. 
Um, you know, I believe that that is necessary because while we have a definition of domestic terrorism, we don't have accompanying charges for those individuals who may meet the definition of, of domestic, uh, carrying out a domestic terrorism act. Now, on the flip side, I'm very well aware of the potential of a domestic terrorism law going completely sideways um, if it's not very narrowly tailored, for instance, um, in a way in which it doesn't abridge um, the freedom of association, um, the freedom of speech rights that we have, and, and the right to bear arms, quite frankly. Um, we, we have to ensure that those basic rights are maintained. And a domestic terrorism law, if it was too broadly constructed, could actually threaten civil liberties in ways in which we saw um, abuses in the 1960s, for instance, um, specifically related to a, a program the FBI had run called uh, Co-Intel Pro, known as Counterintelligence Program, in which the, the rights of a number of, of citizens were trampled to include civil rights activists. So we have to be really careful about whatever domestic terrorism law is created. Another piece I've written before for Lawfare, I go into much more detail about this with a co-writer by the name of Mary McCord, who is a brilliant lawyer. And we say, essentially, and I have long advocated for any law that's actually put in place, that there has to be adequate oversight over that law. And I have made an argument in the past that an oversight mechanism that could be good um, to ensure that law enforcement, for instance, doesn't overstep any new authorities that they could get related to a law um, could come from a group called the Privacy Civil Liberties Oversight Board, where you would have um, independent observers ensuring that any law that is actually passed and implemented is not infringing on civil liberties like we saw in the 1960s. So I, I, I do recognize that it's going to be um, some of these recommendations, not for everybody, um, but I do hope there's at least a discussion because in America today, as I've written in USA Today previously, um, the only people who are being charged with terrorism, generally speaking, in the United States are people who are of color who have tried to join groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda. You know, you can be a white supremacist like Dylan Roof, like I've said before, um, and carry out was clearly a politically motivated act of terrorism and violence that you know, fits the definition of domestic terrorism, he's never going to be legally perceived by the United States government as a terrorist. And to me, um, that is a, a big problem and something we need to address. I, this is more, um, if there is this creation of a uh, uh, domestic terrorism law, it, would that go down to school shooters and people taking actions like that at that level? Or is it politically motivated? That it has to be, be politically motivated. So, you know, they're, they're, you know, in the, in the law itself, it speaks to the, the political motivations of an individual. Um, and it, it speaks to carrying out, you know, clearly violent acts um, of violence against civilians, right? So it would be, uh, you know, very narrowly construed. Um, you know, any act of violence, unless there is some kind of like little tangent to it, you're, you're not touching that. Dylan Roof, as an example, spoke very openly um, about his political motivations of trying to carry out the attack he did that resulted in the deaths of nine black parishioners who were just worshiping at their church of trying to create some kind of um, America that is America for, for white people. Um, and, and the same could be said for um, individuals who have engaged in acts of violence. Like Christopher Hassan is another example that I've written about before. Christopher Hassan was a member of the United States Coast Guard. Um, he was arrest arrested about two years ago. He had a political hit list. And then, thankfully, he was arrested before he could implement his political hit list. Um, he was arrested and charged with a number of gun and drug-related charges. Um, and he was a, a white supremacist, and he's only going to spend 10 years behind bars. If So he'll be out in his like late 50s, early 60s. Um, and he's still, as far as I'm aware, very much a hardcore white supremacist. If he comes out um, in 10 years, I really worry about the safety of people in the community in which he may be living. Um, and he's the type of individual who could have been behind bars for at least another 10 years if the Department of Justice had a, uh, a terrorism charge that they could levy against him. So he was, for instance, targeting people like Nancy Pelosi as just one example. He, he didn't like Democrats. He didn't like um, the liberal media, and they were on his target list. So he's even perhaps a, a better example of where the law actually would have effect. Um, Dylan Roof 
arguably is going to be behind bars with nine life terms um, and is not coming out. There, it would have been more symbolic of highlighting the fact that this person, this white person, was actually engaged in an act of terrorism. A domestic terrorism charge wouldn't have necessarily added more years to his sentence. It, well, it would have added more years to a sentence, but would it have any practical effect like it could have with someone like Christopher Hassan? As you're working with your students at the Middlebury Institute, how do you level that nuance of the importance of protecting people with the importance of liberty and freedom, which the United States was based on? Yeah, absolutely. So you have to go into the the pros and cons of, of all these things. And in my reading list, I, I just don't assign my writings, right? I'm assigning writings of individuals who have very different opinions about things like a domestic terrorism law, for instance. Um, and you have to present both sides of that argument and you have to provide your students, for instance, in the module that I'm teaching in the radical right this year that looks at policy prescription and policy responses, there is a, a reading on the COINTEL program, for instance. Students need to be familiar with history on how laws have been misused or how um, our federal government um, agencies have actually ignored the law um, and have developed programs that are inimical to U.S. Uh, basic civil liberties and rights. And you have to tell those stories, right? But you also have to tell the story on the flip side um, of how the United States has dip disproportionately used terrorism laws against um, brown and black people versus not using laws against white people who may be engaged in the very same activity. And to me, that's a significant problem and an oversight that needs to be remedied. You work at the Center for Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism. Does the most important one of those shift, or is there one that you feel <laughs> is, this is always the most important? Yeah. No, I think they're all equally important. <laughs> they, we, they're, we, they're all your favorite children. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think we have to understand what motivates terrorists to do what they do. We have to understand the underlying ideology. Ideology to me is fundamentally one of the most important elements of understanding why terrorists do what they do. We have to understand what extremism is. And it's as we discussed earlier, it's it's not the same as terrorism. We have to understand that, you know, individuals who are in extremist milieus, who are in extremist groups, try to create worlds of us versus them. And we go into into that in not only my class, but in C Tech, we talk about these things all the time with the uh, groups that we work with on a daily basis. And then we just didn't want to study things. Um, at, at CTEC. We want to actually be part of these policy discussions that are ongoing. And this is where we're a departure for perhaps other kinds of think tanks that, that may just want to study um, both sides of a, of a challenge, but without being involved in the debates related to policy prescription. But we, we feel like it's important to get our views out there. And we always like put our views out there. I did recently. Um, and our views within the center actually aren't always necessarily aligned with each other. Um, and, and that's great. Um, I like to have researchers who actually work with me who think differently from me. So even, you know, we are one center. We have different opinions within our center. And it's a place where people with different opinions um, can share them. And it's a safe space for us to, to debate these things and discuss these things. And we produce things um, in terms of our publications that you may say, well, Jason wrote this, Alex said that, right? And, and that's great that we have these differing views um, because we come from different experiences. Um, and Enrique may have a different view from all, you know, Alex and me. Um, and, and Erica and Megan who work at the center, they may have different views from, from, from the three of us. Um, and I think that's the beauty in, in studying these challenges that uh, you can come up with different ideas and, and share them. And that's what CTEC's about is, is coming up with new ideas offering our ideas for the uh, the public, for our students to engage with. Humor is such a part of uh, mental health and staying positive in the light of all of the horrific things that human beings are capable of, which is balanced by the beauty that humans make. How do you stay positive? How do you refresh your mind after a day of the work that you do? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, the last time we spoke, Andrew, where we, our our, uh, our clip didn't come out as as neatly as we would have liked. I yes. mentioned a few things, and I'll just tell you one of the things I mentioned last time, of course, was for me, 
um, exercise and, and running and, and lifting and engaging in, in sports more generally as a reset. But then, of course, I said that to you probably two days ago, and I haven't gone for a run since because I've just been so busy. So um, I, I'm not practicing what I, I, I typically preach. But for me, it's a great way to spark new ideas, a, a great way to like get in a zone um, that necessarily isn't just, for instance, reading the latest manifesto by the last white supremacist who carried out the, the latest massacre. Um, so that's really important for me. And the second thing I, I, I like to mention is I like to read widely and not just read about what's happening in the extremist um, space. Um, and, and there have been a, a number of great um, pieces of fiction I've read over the last few years. Um, you know, one that uh, the former deputy director, for instance, at CTEC, Chris McGuffey, who's a, a double alum, uh, she graduated from Middlebury College and she graduated from Middlebury Institute. She, she put me on a book called Overstory that I finished last year. And it's reading books like that to me um, that are really important. Of course, you know, at the end of Overstory is this group of, you know, um, environmental extremists. <laughs> so it wasn't completely walking away <laughs> like I had hoped, but um, it was really a, a impactful uh, story. And I was really happy to pick that up. So I really recommend people pick up fiction whenever they can um, that's outside of their little area of, of expertise. Um, and for those of us that are terrorism and extremist researchers, I think it's critically important to read things that aren't necessarily um, in our um, milieu of, of focus. So otherwise it can get really darn depressing. And when I was in the Counterterrorism Bureau at the State Department, it was even harder actually to get away from reading all these like nasty things that terrorists are doing overseas. Because when, when you're in the government, you're re reading um, essentially things that terrorists are saying um, and, and understanding what terrorists are motivated by. And that can be really a dark place. So I really would encourage people in the government too, who are still in the government working on these issues to try to, as best they can, step away when they can to, to do things that are outlets that are completely separate from what they're doing in that 40 hour work week. Uh, thank you um, for taking time again today to chat. I do wanna, um, since this is the week uh, leading up to September 11th to leave some space to recognize the victims of the attacks on that day, all the people who died and suffered in the 20 years following. Um, it's been a really, really painful time for humanity to sort of come face to face with some of those things. Um, is there anything that you would like to pass on to people as they think about September 11th this weekend? I think it's incumbent upon Americans to take a, a time out and think deeply about their place within America today and think about the civilian victims, nearly 3,000 people that lost their lives to an extremist organization and to reflect on that attack, but also to reflect on these last 20 years that um, the United States has made a lot of mistakes that also have resulted in civilian casualties throughout the globe. And we should also think about them as well. Um, it's it's not always just about us as Americans. Um, it is also about the global citizens who have lost their lives to um, decisions made by the U.S. government, and also the global citizens who have lost their lives to terrorist groups throughout the globe. Um, and we're talking about um, many more than 3,000 civilians over these last 20 years who have lost their lives to terrorist groups. And we should also be thinking about them and reflecting upon upon them and their lives as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew.